<laughs> Good evening and a really warm welcome to week 11 of Experiencing God. It is great to uh, see you. Uh, I went on to the uh, YouTube site this week. It is uh, fascinating to see how many people are watching Experiencing God uh, on YouTube. And uh, on some weeks we've had as many, I think as 30 hits uh, mm. for some of the week's material. So week seven, I think, was a really uh, uh, high week. So that's uh, really good because it means that the story is getting out and other people are joining with us. We're not quite sure where from, uh, but that's really good. Uh, so out. if you're watching on YouTube, hello and uh, welcome to Experiencing God here at Holy Trinity uh, with St Michael and all angels across the way in Orkar as well. We've been thinking this week in our readings in this unit um, about the church and I've not been here for a couple of weeks. Uh, I had a retreat at Rydal Hall for three days which was really good fun and uh, a special time and then we came home I did a, a day here where I just basically tried to clear my desk caught up with one or two uh, errands that needed doing and then on Thursday afternoon we set off to see uh, my brother in workshop where he's vicar there of St John's the great church and then we went down to my sister in Horsford in Hampshire and then on Sunday morning we went back to the Church of the Good Shepherd which is the church that Sam and I met in and uh, I grew up there from a lad of 10 until in my 30s so it was great to catch up with folk uh, I saw my oldest <coughs> friend uh, Richard Troughton uh, when I was in my first year of Fernhill Secondary School I didn't know a soul in the class and Richard was the very first person uh, that I met and made uh, friends with. So it was great to catch up with him and some of the other folk uh, that were there. I've told the story of the Good Shepherd uh, before, but it was great to see what God was doing with them and how they had been listening to God, effectively experiencing God over the last couple of years. It was their vision Sunday when we were there, just by uh, chance. And one of the things that they've had a big challenge on is uh, what to do with their services. They're certainly a growing church. And they took the radical step uh, a couple of years ago to shut their evening service. It had been a popular service and there was a, a sustainable number of folk going along to it, although many of them were doubling up going in the evening as well as the, as well as the morning. But they felt that that was what God was saying to them, to make some space in their, their work pattern, uh, to do something different and to do something new. Uh, so 12 months ago, they took the bold step of doubling up their morning service. They were full on uh, Sunday mornings. And what they've done is they've literally uh, divided their morning service in half, uh, one just after nine o'clock, the other at eleven o'clock, and it's a duplicate service. And we went to the second uh, service. What was fascinating to see was uh, we arrived a good uh, three quarters of an hour before the service had started because we weren't sure how long the drive was going to take us from Oxford. We couldn't get into the car park. I had to stop park. The car parking was worse than here uh, tonight, and that's bad. And they've got a big, laid out, properly marked, tarmac <laughs> car park. You'd be jealous of it, but there we go. That's another story. Uh, so already, their doubling up had made space for uh, new folk. And it was really uh, great to see that actually we didn't know half the folk uh, there. One of the folk we didn't know was the, the church treasurer. And halfway through uh, the sermon, he was invited to speak about how God had been speaking into his life. You know, sometimes when God speaks, it leads us to a crisis. crisis. Okay. Uh, what God was speaking into his life as treasurer was that he needed to double 
double his giving. <coughs> they are facing a new step challenge uh, with the increased number of folk they've got coming. They wanted to appoint an assistant minister. If they were going to do so, they would have to pay for the whole of that person's stipend. And that was going to be a significant amount of money. The diocese would provide a house, uh, but they needed to provide the whole of uh, the stipend. But they felt that God was calling them in to uh, that step. And that was part of what the Vision Day was uh, all about. So it was really exciting to hear uh, that they had sufficient funds already given and promised uh, to enable them to advertise for the post and to announce that Sunday that they had appointed. Clearly uh, this was an extra step for them. Uh, they were looking at a significant increase in their annual budget, probably of around the 30% order to make that appointment. Uh, the reason I tell you that story is because it just seems so appropriate to the material <coughs> that we have been looking at in experiencing God. So far we've been thinking about how does God lead us as an individual? But of course we're, as a church, not individuals. We are the body of Christ. Remember? What, me? The body of Christ? No. You, you are the body of Christ. Collective. And uh, that's what we've been thinking about uh, this week. How does God lead us as the body? body of Christ. Now, is that the vicar's job? No. No, no that's surely what we've been learning, actually, is that when God leads, he leads us all. Yes, there is a role for someone who is pastoring, and we've seen that uh, this week, and I believe very much that God has called me to that uh, task here alongside the ministry team, and certainly uh, and David at St Michael's to, to provide some leadership, to provide some pastoring, some teaching, some encouragement. But actually, where does the ministry come from? It comes from all of you. And I love it when I hear stories about uh, folk beating us to the hospital, uh, to someone who's in need. That's great because actually that's the church in operation. It's the way we were designed to function as the body of Christ. So I want to shift us on to uh, the material we've been looking at uh, this week. Uh, Brian's going to shift us on with a slide now. If you turn to uh, page 200, it's the very first day, in the sidebar you'll see a quote from uh, the third paragraph. When a church allows God's presence and activity to be expressed, a watching world will be drawn to him. I was talking to someone on Sunday morning who fairly new back into Formby. Why had they come to Holy Trinity? Because they'd heard about the impact of Food Bank and thought, actually, that's something I'd really like to be involved in. How can I get involved with that? I'm going to go to the church where it's going on. Their website looks interesting, by the way. And uh, that was not what I was expecting <coughs> at all. Now, I'm not quite sure where that's going to lead for that individual. But actually, surely that's part of what that quote is all about. So I've got two questions for us from that quote, just to get us started. How can our church be that kind of congregation? At St Michael and All Angels, <coughs> at Redgate and at Rosemary Lane. How can we be those <coughs> sorts of congregations? Now bear in mind, of course, that we are 
not one congregation, not three, but <coughs> eight congregations. How can we be those sorts of congregations? And what does God want for his church? That's a slightly different aspect of some of the stuff that we were looking at on day one. And if you want a bit of a clue, just look across the page to 201 <coughs> and the highlighted box. But don't go there too quickly. <laughs> because we're going to come back to that point. Off you go, you've got about eight minutes on that. Well, uh, just for a bit of a laugh, uh, and uh, so you know, uh, much to Ian's disappointment, I've removed the stars from <laughs> behind, because they looked like they were coming out of my head, and no one, no one had told me that. <laughs> A rotten lot, so it'll look like uh, broken continuity, but that's why they've that's why they've got Photoshop them. Yeah, you reckon? <laughs> no, Photoshop them back in, or like. <laughs> uh, we've been talking about ourselves as a body. Now, what that should remind you about this week's memory verse, which is from Romans chapter twelve, verse five. Let's see how you can get on. In Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Yep. Yeah. Well, you've got it. Well done. Uh, you know, uh, Paul talks about this image of the body in more than one place. It's one of those metaphors that he returns to. Why? Because it's important. You... <coughs> the body of Christ. Now we're going to run on to the next slide, please. Thank you, Brian. One of the things that uh, we've been thinking about as a church is that our need to be united in purpose and in vision in the way that we go forward. And one of the ways that that <coughs> unity happens is through our encouragement of each other. I've used this metaphor before, but if we are the body of Christ, uh, actually if there are broken relationships between us, then it's not just down to those two people who have got a broken relationship. If I've fallen out with John, uh, you might think, well that's tough for John and Mark, but actually it affects all of us, because we are the body of Christ. If you have got a broken toe, it hurts like crazy. And if we are uh, having unity as a key value of our life together, uh, then we need to be a people who will walk over broken glass, if necessary, to maintain our <coughs> relationships. That's not always uh, that's not always easy. Uh, one of my favourite preachers is Dr. Bob, uh, who preaches at Grange uh, Community Church, which is one of the uh, churches that we've got a lot of our ideas for <coughs> from uh, experiencing God. And uh, you can go on and watch his version of uh, Week Eleven. Uh, in his preaching, he is very honest about the relationship that he has uh, with his parents. He was clearly abused. By them as a child and it has always been difficult for him and it's clearly scarred him and marked him and uh, the night before he was presenting week 11 uh, he had a phone call from his mum it was a message on the answer phone and clearly it was one of those messages that just hurt cut deep was cruel in fact. And uh, he's gone to the college where he's a lecturer and uh, there is a young man there that uh, is in his class and uh, he gives him a daily devotion and he just says, I think Bob this is for you. Uh, and when he reads it he knows it's for him uh, because this devotional is all about what happens when we are in those sort of relationships which are, are hurtful and there's nothing that we can do about it. What was the suggestion that he received? Well actually 
when we've got those folk who have hurt us badly, the suggestion was that we should pray for them. Not pray that they will change their ways, by the way. No. Pray for God's very best for that person, for God's grace to be poured out on them, as undeserved as that might be, for God's blessing unreservedly to be poured into their lives, for God's very best. What a challenge to pray for those who have hurt us. But actually, as he started the day, he prayed for his mum. And uh, it was incredibly moving as he told that story of uh, how he prayed for God's <coughs> fullest blessing for his mum that day, despite the message that she'd left on the answer phone, despite the years of abuse and rejection that uh, he had experienced. Lord, will you please bless my mum? May she just be in such a place today that she knows your favour. Will she be aware of your love? And Lord, whatever she's doing, may you just be with her and may she know your protection today. Amen. No, Lord, will you sort her out? No, nothing but the best. Isn't that a great way to pray for those people in church who actually <coughs> rub us a little bit up <coughs> the wrong way, who we might call EGR, extra grace required. Because I've got folk like that in my life, EGR, but guess what? I am probably also some of your <laughs> E-G-R's. It's true, isn't it? Yeah? Pam? Yeah. yeah when, you've, yeah? When, when the vicar said he's going to do something for the warden and he's sort of ticking on a bit, extra grace required. Yeah. Fiona. Yeah. What it's what it's like to be in the office working for me, eh? <laughs> Extra grace required. Maggie, when you're after the hymns on Wednesday, and I haven't even got my head out of last Sunday, you know? Extra grace required. And it's the same, it's it's the way it works, isn't it? So <coughs> What are, we, what are we united about? Well, above all, um, we have to be united around a creedal statement, don't we? And if there is, and I, there is stuff I know that around us as a ministry team at Holy Trinity, we do not all agree about uh, to do with what the Bible says. Uh, but this I know, that actually we can rally around this one fact. Jesus is Lord. And actually, uh, once we've got past that, really, it's all detailed, isn't it? Once, once, we, once we acknowledge the complete kingship, the lordship of Jesus, then actually around the non-essential stuff, there needs to be a, a liberty about what we believe and how we approach that. Uh, you will know that I am pretty conservative. If you haven't worked that one out now, in terms of my doctrine, in the way that I handle scripture, I think Sue is as well. But there are others on the ministry team who uh, take up more liberal approach. That's great. Uh, as long as we are preaching the lordship of G Jesus. So there needs to be a, a liberty there in the way that we relate to each other. And above all, there needs to be, surely, some some charity as well for those who are, are different from us. Let's move on, Brian. Could you please turn to activity number one on page 218. There we go. Good. Now, I know that some of you might have struggled to, to do this portion. 
But uh, all of these verses are about the way that we relate to each other. So where it's got God's will, perhaps you've answered it, but perhaps you haven't. If you haven't, now's a grace moment for you all to catch up together. So look at that first verse. What is God's will for us as the body of Christ? Well, I'll give you the first answer. It is that we accept one another. Yeah? So for the next eight minutes or so, go through these verses, share your responses, and see how you get along. So as we're looking at these one another's, and they are fantastic, aren't they? Uh, think about which one of these behaviours you're going to endeavour to adopt to encourage unity in our churches. And have a think about which ones you're most challenged by. Which ones are going to be an easy win? And which ones actually are you going to be a real, a real challenge for you? And ask God for help with those as well. Off you go. Okay. <laughs> Do you know, I reckon this page, if we were to take it seriously as, as congregations, this page would be worth the nine quid that you paid for this book alone. It would. If we were to see this at operation across our different congregations, it would be uh, transformed, transformational. If you just look across the page, Look at the way the Balakabes listed uh, the impacts that uh, we might see. Uh, don't be quick to judge one another in matters that are disputed. <coughs> don't be selfish. Yeah, as we take this stuff to heart, it would transform our community. There would be a winsomeness uh, that would be so attractive to folk. Now, one of the things that uh, Henry Blackaby talks about in the, in the book is the way that uh, actually when new people come to church, actually our body is being changed and transformed, isn't it? Actually, as new people come in, actually uh, God is placing them within our body for a purpose. We all have different uh, gifts, abilities, callings, passions, uh, and did you get the bit where he talked about the, uh, the, they worked out there was a lot of medics suddenly being attracted to their church and how that set off a whole new work uh, for them, which opened doors for them that they, they weren't going to have. It was a really exciting uh, story. So I thought I'd tell you a, a, just a funny story, really. Um, it's about how I came to play the drums, but actually there's a serious point to it as well. <coughs> Some of you are saying I didn't know he did. <laughs> <laughs> Not in time, anyway, yeah. Uh, when I got to St. Philemon's, uh, Dave and Derek were the music group, and they were fantastic. Uh, they could turn up, Maggie, at one minute <laughs> to 11. They could plug their guitars in and they could sing anything pre-1990 from Mission Praise. <coughs> at the drop of a hat. They've been playing together since they were 11, 12. They'd grown up, you know. In Liverpool, the Beatles were king. That's what they wanted to emulate. So they could do anything from Mission Praise, the pair of them, they could play it really well. Uh, but they had added nothing to their repertoire at all. And uh, I just thought, they're okay, but they need a real kick up the pants, basically. <laughs> um, so I started to pray uh, as 
Vicar of St Philemon's for some new musicians. And what I was praying for was that actually we'd be able to build up a, a band. So I thought a keyboard player would be fantastic. Wouldn't it be great uh, if we could have a keyboard player? Wouldn't it be great uh, if we could have a drummer? and uh, someone to play the, the bass and some other instruments to fill it out. I even prayed for a trumpeter. <laughs> so here's the story. Uh, within a few weeks of consistently praying that prayer, a fellow called Derek Atherton, uh, who's down the road, a reader at a church called St Agnes, which is the most spiky Anglo-Catholic church you could <laughs> imagine, came to me and said, Mark, I've got this drum kit at home. I want to give it to a church, but clearly I cannot give it to St Agnes. So I thought about St Philemon's. I'd like to give you a drum kit, and I'd like to give you lessons. Now I'm thinking, where on earth did that one come from? But I've been praying for a drummer. It started a sort of remarkable bit of ministry for me. We set up, Derek and I, a drum club. Uh, and at its height, we had nine drum kits in St Philemon's church, which we would pack away into a cupboard at the back of church. <coughs> and uh, all these kids blazing away on uh, these drum kits. Uh, but what we did uh, with that club was uh, put drum kits into five different churches with drummers for their music groups and I got to learn to play the drums as well. We would have two drum kits at St Philemon's every Sunday and one of the lads would sit beside me and play the drums alongside me and I would be there counting them in. Uh, and then we got someone to come and play the keyboard, which it is a fantastic keyboard player and he'd heard about some filing he was from the Isle of Man coming to Liverpool as a, a student it was our, our first student to come to uh, some filing was fabulous keyboard player and he was with us for three years suddenly bass drums keyboard player then Christopher bless him was learning the trumpet <laughs> and he was just <laughs> He's ten, and he loves Christmas carols, <clears throat> uh, and that's what, that's what he learned to play. But it's, it's gradually, he developed a voice in uh, the music group. We had a couple round uh, the corner who worshipped at Frontline, and I've always tried not to be covetous of other churches' members. But you, sometimes, as a minister, you can't you can't help it. Because <laughs> yeah, that was not cover indeed. Yeah, but I did think it was a bit ridiculous because they were just fantastic evangelists in Toxteth, uh, and they would uh, sweep up all these people in Toxteth on Sunday morning and take them to church. Uh, but when their car was just a bit too full, as in they persuaded too many people to come to church. They would drive around to St Philemon's and say, there you go, Mark, here's Jimmy, you know. He needs to hear about Jesus. And they'd go <coughs> with us, really, and say, I'll be back for them in an hour. We haven't got room for them in the car. So I was really praying that, that Paul and Sandra would uh, join St Philemon's. Tom was saying, there's no way they'll come because uh, he knew them a little bit, he was the curate. And I was saying, no, well, look, it's a bit ridiculous. They live on our doorstep, and they're dropping people off to us to come to church and then going on to front line with a, with a car full. Well, Paul and Sandra uh, joined. Oh, praise the Lord. You know, thank you, Lord. And then Paul said to me, Mark, I've just bought an accordion. <laughs> I don't know how to play it, <laughs> but I'd love to play in the music group. And I'm thinking, oh Lord, <laughs> how am I, how am I gonna, how am I gonna get round this one? How on earth am I gonna get round this one? 
And uh, I was think, also thinking about Derek, who by now is really driving the music group on. <coughs> He's really proficient in his guitar playing. He's drawn his son Andrew into the band, who's now playing a professional standard of, of guitaring. And uh, so he was playing on the on the bass. Andrew was playing lead guitar. It was we were really filling out as the sound and starting to to sound good. What on earth were we going to do with an accordion? Uh, so uh, we said to Paul, come along to Music Group. Uh, and we sat him at the very back of the hall. And we gave him, and we gave him, some, gave him some music and said, there you go, Paul, that's what we're playing. If you want to just sort of squeeze along with us, uh, we'll see how you, how you get along. Well, a few weeks later, we're starting to think, actually, we can hear Paul. And he's almost in tune with us. Just come a bit closer, Paul. <laughs> and uh, then he was growing in confidence. And actually, God was, I think, enabling him in a very beautiful way to find a place to belong in St Philemon's where he could use his passion and this new found talent. In just the same way that I was learning the drums, Paul was learning the accordion. Uh, so we beckoned him over and say, come and play with us. And then we microphoned him up. And then uh, we put him on the, the, front, the front row. So Una, yes. when you came, to spy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Paul would have been Paul would have been playing the accordion. And what he did for us was he gave us this sort of almost fantastic Hammond sound mm -hmm. underneath the piano and the, the guitars, which just really filled out out the out the music group. Now, the reason I tell this story is because um, I believe that God has a place for all of us in Holy Trinity. We are the body, <coughs> the body of Christ. Aren't we? And one of the things that's key for us is to identify where we belong. It's no good us thinking we're an elbow when actually we're a knee. You know what I mean? Yeah? So... Uh, Blackaby tells that story about the woman who wants to be a hospital visitor, yeah? Uh, and he's, he says, great, because well, not many people are up for hospital visiting normally. Uh, and he gets uh, straight into a hospital visiting and then has to pick up the pieces behind her because everywhere she goes, she causes devastation by telling people that actually, I know so, exactly someone who had that and they died. <laughs> she... But what he discovered was what? That actually she was a fantastic prayer. It's a, beauty, it's a beautiful story. Uh, and she, because of his encouragement, uh, instead of being a round peg in a square hole, became very much a round peg in a round, round hole with uh, his encouragement uh, and believe you me you are in St Michael and all angels in Holy Trinity Red Gates in Holy Trinity Rosemary Lane because God wants you here he has called you to be part of the body of Christ in this place and he has a unique unique place for you in his body which he has ordained and he has designed so if you've got a burning desire to play the accordion <laughs> let me know uh, how, uh, we've got a little mnemonic which is really helpful for us to to uh, think about this actually yeah god's created us different shapes hasn't he okay so uh here we go. Uh, S. This isn't in the book. Okay, so you might want to scribble this down on the inside of your cover. Would you like me to? As we read the Bible, Paul will list 
in his letters different uh, spiritual gifts and commentators will tell you that there are perhaps 18 different gifts or 21 or more than that as they look at those as they look at those different gifts that are in the Bible. How many gifts are there? Well, I think the answer is this. There are as many different gifts as there are as many different needs in the body of Christ. We all have a particular part to play. And we have these God-given gifts. Uh, a sweet spot, if you like. Uh, so uh, how, do we, how do we go about discovering what that might be? Well, H is for heart. What, what has God given you a, a heart for, a passion for? For my daughter, Emily, <coughs> it is children's work, telling children about Jesus. She is absolutely passionate about it. I can do it, uh, but she is passionate about it. If I do it, it wears me out. She is energised by it. Then E, uh, A, sorry, A for, A for abilities. What, what innate gifts has God given us that we're already good at? Jim, your magic, for instance. Yeah, we've all been blessed by that. What, what abilities has God given specifically <coughs> to you? Perhaps you've already got a musical gift which you're not using in, in church. What, what abilities has God given to you? Then, your personality. Yeah, uh, Some of us are introvert and some of us are extrovert. <laughs> but we all have different personalities, don't we? <coughs> yeah. what, 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 does, what is your personality uh, suited to? And then lastly, what experiences have God already built into your life? Perhaps, actually, it's been a bad experience. But even those bad experiences, God can use and redeem. After all, it's in a hurting, Paul says, that we're able to come alongside others who are hurting. So Jimmy at St. Philemon's had to stand down as caretaker of uh, St. Silas, where Jonathan's head, and uh, he's been on the governor's because he suffered from epilepsy. Now, it's not good that Jim's got epilepsy. It is incredibly, incredibly debilitating uh, for him. Uh, in, uh, in every way. Uh, but when we discovered that Emily, our oldest daughter, had epilepsy, who was it that was able to come alongside her in a way that no one else could? To encourage her, to share with her, but Jimmy. Uh, and that's what he did. Uh, so God is able to use our experiences. Sometimes they're not good experiences. They will often be painful, heartache experiences. But God is able to use them. We each have a unique shape. Uh, and that's the way that we work in the body of Christ. So how do we discover our, our round hole for our round pegs? Perhaps this little... Um, so move us back. <coughs> Perhaps this little word, word shape will help us to, uh, to think that through. <coughs> so, we've been thinking about church as the uh, body of Christ. You can move us on now, Brian. Um, in your own words, we started with this, we're going to come back to it now, uh, and you'll see this said in a different way on page 214, I hope. Uh, in your own words, write three concerns God has for the body of Christ. And if you look to page 223, there's a big gap in your book for you to put the answer to that. So as you're chatting, you might want to write that down. Three concerns God has for the body of Christ. <coughs> Yeah.
Very quickly, for a couple of minutes, I'd love it if you could articulate your answers to these questions. Now, actually, I think some of us are going to feel a little bit embarrassed by this. Um, don't be shy in saying why you think God has put you in St. Michael's or Redgate or Rosemary Lane. Why do you think God has added you to your church body? And where do you in your church most effective? So what do you do in your church that most effectively helps build up the body of, of Christ? What are you doing that most effectively builds up the body of Christ? And again, there's a place to respond to that on page 223. Just a couple of minutes on that, and then I will uh, finish up and pray for us. Is there something about our Britishness which actually makes it easier for us to say that about someone else rather than about ourselves? But actually, um, Paul encourages us to have a sort of sober judgment of ourselves and our gifts so that we recognise where we really do fit into the body of Christ. Uh, that's one of the passages that Blackaby's encouraged us to look at this week from Romans chapter 12. So, next week, I, I'm really looking forward to next week. It's our last uh, week of meeting together formally, and you'll notice that there's another week's worth of material uh, after that. Uh, how about this for an idea? And you might want to take it up or you might not. Um, but as a table, why not think about, uh, we're not meeting together for week 13, but you could, couldn't you? Your table could why, meet. Why are we not meeting? Because we? uh, right, it's running right into Christmas. So that's why we, we've... So what I'm saying is, for your last week, why not just get together, you know? Perhaps go to, I don't know. Meet here on Tuesday morning at Celia's or go to Costa or, or whatever, but meet, meet, meet together. Go to the pub. Okay, so next week, before you get before you all start looking at your diaries, next week we're looking at uh, mission and the way that we are called into mission. And here's the truth that we're going to be learning right on the first page of next week's unit. You cannot be in a relationship with Jesus and not be on mission. Yeah? You can't be. Uh, Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. And we'll be looking at that uh, more next week. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the friendships that we've made around our tables at Experiencing God. Thank you, Father, too, for the gifts that we see around our tables that you've given to each of us. Thank you that we see that in each other. Lord, thank you for the beauty in that. Lord, as we've thought about some difficult stuff tonight, we think about those for whom we find it really difficult to pray. Lord, will you please give us a heart tonight to pray for them in a way which is without reservation, but just seeking your deepest and biggest blessing. Lord, will you give us that extra grace that we all require to handle those who we find difficult. And Lord, above all, will you please help us to see our own shape, the beauty that you've made in each of us and the uniqueness that you've placed in each of us to serve in your body here in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.